Hello. Hey, Matt. How are you? Good. How are you? Uh, very well. So you are uh, live. And let me give an introduction uh, quickly, and then I can hand it over to you to um, introduce Neighborhood Goods. Great. Uh, so Matt Alexander is the co-founder and CEO of Neighborhood Goods. He's also the co-founder of a nonprofit retail concept, Unbranded, um, an advisor to a number of uh, startups. Uh, Neighborhood Goods is a new type of department store featuring ever-changing landscape of thoughtful, exciting, and contemporary brands and stories. It strives to be a place for community, bringing together uh, people to shop, eat, discover, and learn across its stores. Um, Matt's going to give an introduction to Neighborhood Goods and then talk a little bit about um, you know, the current environment. Great. Well, thank you so much. So I've just sort of prepared sort of a high level of, you know, what neighborhood goods is, what we stand for, what we do. And I'd be happy to answer um, any questions towards the end. But if we run out of time, you can always feel free to reach out to me. It's just Matt at neighborhoodgoods.com. Um, so in general, we describe ourselves as a new type of department store. Um, it's relatively inaccurate you know it's just really more to provide a useful sense of what you might expect when you come into the room where it has the hallmarks of being a little bit like a department store where it's a shoppable room full of all sorts of different brands covering most different product categories but then from there very 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 different so um you know we've been around since about uh, 2017, the company was founded, but we launched our first location in November 2018. We now have three locations and um, we sort of offer different services and different functions from one location to the next in as much as we can sort of create something that's very valuable for brands beyond just a fixed physical retail space. So you can think of it as being sort of a hop, skip and a jump away from brands hosting their own pop-ups but we staff it, build it, design it. Uh, in addition, we also run our own restaurant. We provide a huge amount of data. We have a lot of technology running on the side. And so the result for these brands is that it turns into a very robust customer acquisition tool, um, but it's a very, very easy one to run in the physical space. Um, and so, you know, it really allows for all sorts of different sort of um, experiences and it's something that we really saw as being particularly relevant to sort of younger direct consumer digitally native brands when we started but uh, just in this image of both of these images alone right here which are of our store in Austin you see brands like Aesop and Tarshan and Skagen off to the side there all very well established brands that are starting to work with us as well um, so the result is that for brands you know the the, the core observation being that um, customer acquisition costs have been going significantly upward online. Um, they're currently very low uh, for, you know, probably a short term period. Um, physical retail had been seen as a solution where brands could get into the space, um, really get in front of their customers, have more of a day to day sort of conversation, engender and foster that much more loyalty in just having that level of proximity and utility of availability right there in a given area and it can turn into this very powerful tool. Um, but, you know, physical retail is still incredibly complicated, still incredibly expensive, still incredibly difficult to pursue. And so with neighborhood goods, you sort of get into that space and you get all the same data, all the same sales, but without all the effort of having to get into that in the first place and develop your own strategy. Um, so, you know, behind the scenes, uh, what we provide to brands, obviously, first and foremost is physical space. Um, so they get anywhere from 50 to 500 square feet. Um, we have cameras built into the ceiling that use computer vision to assess general traffic into your space in addition to demographics, repeat visits, all that sort of stuff. So that you can start getting web-like um, metrics to understand what's happening in your space. Something that would, again, be very difficult to do in your own pop-up, but very straightforward to do in this sort of setting. Um, from there, you also uh, have our staff who are trained on all of your brands and you just end up with something very beautiful. And so our fixtures are designed to ostensibly get out of their own way where they're just very visually dynamic, uh, but doesn't require you to sort of, um, to, to sort of feel worried that we're going to override your brand. So a lot of white, a lot of very simple neutral tones so that you can come in with, as you can see here for a brand like stadium goods, 
um, just really sort of vibrant, colorful product, your own branding, and then suddenly it feels like a very distinct moment for you without a huge amount of effort. You can also see here that all the shelving and shapes within these fixtures, all of which are proprietary, are modular. So you can quickly modify and sort of shape anything the way you want it to be. And so uh, with Stadium Goods, they were one of our launch brands back in uh, 2018, and they wanted this shoe wall like they have in their original store in Soho in New York. And so we built it out to sort of have the same thing here. Very easy to do, saves a lot of money, and makes it really straightforward. Um, for brands in this current climate, the other thing that we help unlock beyond just the physical availability of product is same day delivery, uh, store pickup, and things that have become very, very useful on an on-demand basis for consumers. And so what well, I think we've seen over the past few months, a lot of challenges uh, with supply chain and general logistics for a lot of brands and certainly for a lot of different products across all sorts of different categories. Uh, for us, because our stores double as warehouses, it means that our stores have sort of doubled as these great repositories of products that otherwise might take a long time to reach customers otherwise. And so uh, we have a partnership with Postmates that allows for uh, products to be delivered within an hour or two from each of our locations. Uh, we obviously ship as well. Um, and then obviously we've been doing curbside. And so we've been doing that both for retail and restaurant. Um, Typically, historically, we've hosted a huge amount of events in those spaces as well. And so for our brands, we always saw that as being massively important to really sort of foster that much of a closer relationship. And so we've had, you know, anything from uh, events with, you know, Serena Williams, as pictured here, uh, launching a size inclusive product line called Serena Great, uh, all the way across to uh, conferences with the likes of Create and Cultivate and all manner of others. Um, last year, we hosted between two to three events per week in our inaugural location in uh, Plano, Texas. And it's just something that's driven this very, very rich and very interesting sort of dynamic in the relationship with the consumer where we've had people come to the space and spend, you know, up to, if not exceeding, 40 minutes in the store. Um, and considering they're large, but they're not that large, um, that's a very disproportionately high amount of time to spend in, in the room. And then from there, we see a very strong repeat purchase rate. And we also see um, just general loyalty towards the brands extending beyond our walls as well. So it's really sort of working both for acquisition, day-to-day -day sales, and then generally fostering a really sort of positive dynamic with the consumer. Obviously, we're not sort of trying to excessively sell to people. We want it to be a very communal place. We want the magnetism of the store to be very much uh, around providing a really good and dignified reason for you to be there in the first place not something purely transactional. And so that's certainly been something that we've seen borne out uh, since we launched. Um, as I mentioned, we have restaurants in each of our locations as well, which obviously serves the additional purpose there around events, but also to help you know, with that sense of magnetism and provide people a reason to come into the space. Um, we have an amazing team, so we provide the staff. So it was important for us from the beginning to have a really cohesive experience. So if you walked into sort of a room and there were all sorts of different pop-ups from all sorts of different brands, it would be very quick and easy to end up in a really sort of uh, lesser sort of customer experience perspective where you're sort of having to transact with one brand here, another brand here. Whereas with us, you can shop with, you know, Rothy's on one side of the room and then quickly transition to the over, to the other side and shop with Fairty and do the whole thing with the same store associate because they're cross-trained across all brands and knowledgeable about all of them. And so that's been incredibly impactful uh, just in the past few days, we've also been rolling out um, a live chat and sort of personal shopping feature on our site that allows for people to interact with the store staff and sort of go through that sort of personal shopping experience if they're not comfortable coming in to visit at the moment. And so uh, that's been very meaningful. You can do video calls, you can share certain products and otherwise. And so um, the staffing has ended up being one of the most sort of fundamentally important aspects of our business. Um, so, you know, for brands, you, ultimately, at the end of the day, you get amazing real estate, you get a great team, you get a huge amount of data, and you're in very proven areas that can drive a lot of sales. And so if you're there for sales, it's obviously very productive. If you're there for marketing and customer acquisition, productive as well. And it just lacks the sort of difficulty that would traditionally be associated with this sort of effort. Um, we're online as well. Uh, so in the early days, we had about, you know, a small smattering of our brands uh, were also online. Uh, today, we now have uh, over, I think, 100 of our brands are online. Um, and so we are giving charitable donations with each purchase online, um, up to 10%. Uh, 
um, which has been evolving over time for different causes. Um, we enable for install pickup on demand, obviously, and all sorts of other aspects as well. It's also a big and important channel for us to be really focused on editorial and to really sort of uh, hit home that aspect of the experience. We have an, our own app. It's currently not available in the App Store. It will be back in about two weeks, uh, which allows for self-checkout. Um, it also has location awareness. So if you're inside the store and you're sitting in our restaurant, for example, and you decide that you want to um, buy a pair of Rothy's from across the room, we can have them brought to you based on your location and triangulate where you are. And it still it keeps your privacy intact. It's purely passive. So you are in control of when you ping that and when your device is in communication with the hardware. And so it just allows for that much more of the ability for the consumer to ostensibly dictate their own terms as to how they want to shop with us, whether they want to buy in person, whether they want to self-check out, whether they want to uh, order for pickup, whether they want to order for same day delivery, whether they want to order for domestic shipping or otherwise, these are all options we have available within our ecosystem that would typically not be available for the vast majority of brands we work with. Um, for our brands, we also provide real-time data so this is just a sample. It's not completely rolled out yet, um, but we provide traffic, sales, and all sorts of other metrics in a very simple and easy to use platform. It also allows for them to onboard themselves. Um, so really nice and easy and something that's really rich and dense with information for uh, brands as well. And um, you know, beyond that, we also make it really easy uh, from a marketing perspective. So you know, if you're hosting your own pop-up, I mentioned events, but you're also looking at paid media, billboards, all sorts of different things to make it really sticky and sort of get it in front of people. Uh, for us, you know, in 2019 alone, we had um, over 3 billion press impressions um, and we've won a number of awards. Uh, just recently, uh, Fast Company named us as one of the top 10 most innovative retailers in the world for 2020. Um, and we get a huge amount of attention for that. And we like to funnel that back towards our brands, towards the space and foster more of that dynamic there. And the stores really served that purpose too, where we've seen store associates having conversations with journalists, um, which has fostered very sort of organic and very genuine sort of uh, connection between them. And has resulted in things like um, major national news placement and other ones. Um, we also, you know, do a huge amount of course, for social, of course, for events, although it's very much on pause at the moment and otherwise. Um, from an economics perspective, brands, they either pay us a fixed fee uh, and take 100% of what they sell or they pay us a lesser fee and we take a percentage of sales. And that's really as simple as it gets. I mean, uh, really, really straightforward, makes it really easy and very, very sort of distinct and unique for each of these brands. Um, just recently, we've launched a nonprofit initiative called The Commons for brands that have lost meaningful sales due to COVID-19, where we're providing free space uh, inside the store. So uh, we're doing different classes of brands. We had a huge amount of applications. And so we're rolling through that at the moment um, and allowing brands to come in on a different basis. We're also testing more sort of shop in shops with larger brands, in addition to doing more strategic partnerships with large, large, large brands that really want to be integrated into the space as well. Um, We've also been really investing in private label and collaborations. And so um, we've done a huge amount in the past few months. Um, but, you know, anything from our own line of just basic T-shirts, hats, things like that would have been disproportionately popular across the collaborations we've done uh, with all sorts of different artists, whether local, national or otherwise, and so much more on the way this year. So we have three locations I mentioned up top. Um, we think of locations a little bit differently. So typically people will talk about, you know, LA versus New York um, and just sort of look at really the name of the place and think about where they want to be and um, purely from a brand perspective. And so there's certainly that aspect for us, but what's really important for us is looking at a, a space really more uh, as a list of features and functions that befit different goals on behalf of different brands. So when we're looking at it, um, we end up looking at locations that would otherwise not be immediately intuitive for a lot of these brands because it can create a huge amount of value for them. Uh, so the chief example being our first location, which is in Plano, Texas, which many of you probably don't know, uh, which is a suburb just outside of Dallas, um, massively dense with sort of ideal customer for these sorts of brands, but sort of relatively inaccessible for uh, the brands to open the store as well, not immediately intuitive or obvious but can be really meaningful in terms of sales. And so that's our first location. Uh, it currently has about uh, 60 brands active. In fact, probably more than that with the commons now. 
uh, but it's home to the first ever physical retail for brands like Dollar Shave Club. Uh, we've had brands like Hill City, uh, Hems, Stadium Goods, you've seen Rothy's, Guyana, all manner of them, um, and many of them remain. Um, and so this one is our first, and it's been open for about a year and a half, just over, and um, doing really well. Um, our second location was uh, Chelsea Market in New York. So in this image, um, we're sort of right to the right of the Chelsea Market sign. Um, we have a smaller space there. It's a little bit more blended, but it allows for access to a really interesting demographic of people where many of our brands are typically open in Soho. Um, in Chelsea, it's a really sort of ideal demographic of both residential and commercial activity. And also there's much less vacancy so it's much more expensive to host a pop-up there or open something permanent and you also have the tourist traffic as well for something like the market so a huge amount of traffic there as well um and so there we have about 50 brands active at the moment um gets a huge amount of traffic and so we've had anything from like the first physical presence in the us with brands like the curated brands like master and dynamic rothy's again the arrivals tashin all sorts um a really really special space though and then just most recently, we opened uh, on South Congress in Austin uh, on March 13th. Uh, we promptly had to close uh, all of our locations on March 14th. Um, but we've since reopened in Texas, although now we're sort of having to assess whether or not we'll have to close down again. Um, but this space launched with about 52 brands. It has another version of our restaurant there um, and has, you know, some really well-established brands like Aesop, Entire World, Laleen, in addition to sort of more local and sort of independent brands like Tribe Alive and uh, Maud and so on and so forth. And so uh, a really special space as well. And so that's really it for us at Neighborhood Goods. You know, we describe ourselves as a department store. As I say, it's that's really only an aspect of the story. We're really a lot more, whether you look at us as a marketing platform, a real estate platform, a retail platform or otherwise, um, there's really a lot that we provide to all sorts of different brands, both digitally and physically. Um, what we found, you know, we've been closed or we were closed from March 14th through uh, June 8th in Texas. Um, we found our digital sales grew massively during that time, somewhere around 500 percent off the top of my head uh, over the previous several months and significantly by comparison to the same period last year and outperformed our stores in the same period uh, last year. And that momentum has remained since opening the stores as well, just to touch on it. Um, the stores have been drastically outperforming our expectations. We'd expected really sort of depressed uh, consumer demand upon reopening. But what we've seen is um, you know, outperforming the growth we were seeing earlier this year, which was spectacular and outperforming the same period last year. And so heading in a really exciting direction, but with the gigantic caveat that, you know, we're likely going to face, whether in the near term or longer term, further closures. And so we're certainly looking at that. Um, but we hope it's going to be a little bit more localized and individualized. So if we're opening up in New York shortly um, to the public. Uh, we'll have to wait and see on uh, Texas, but a huge amount of exciting stuff in the pipeline. We're hearing from more brands than ever. Um, the spaces are more full than ever. And um, it's been really exciting to sort of use this time to really do the housekeeping even and sort of improve upon these core aspects and build up the digital aspect, which we've been hoping to do for quite some time as well. And so that's a quick overview of Neighborhood Goods. As I mentioned, you can always feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to answer any questions. Um, but thanks for listening in. Great, Matt. Thank you very much. Maybe before we shift to the breakout session uh, for any questions, uh, a quick uh, question for you about uh, the type of brands that Neighborhood Goods works best for. Uh, yeah. You profiled a bunch, and on the website you have a bunch more. And, and some, like Sonos, are quite large, you know, it's a publicly traded company. Uh, how do you think about the right brand for uh, neighborhood goods? Is it a size? Is it, is it like an ethos perspective? Like uh, what makes it the right fit? It, yeah, it's probably more of the soft aspect. It's really uh, whether or not they have the willingness and inclination to do something interesting inside the room. You know, we'd love to do something with a brand like Nike for argument's sake, but it would be massively uninteresting if they just wanted to come in and do a Nike store. You know, they have Nike stores all over the place. Mm. If they wanted to do a special concept that evolved over time and touched on sort of culturally, culturally relevant sort of topics, um, much more interesting. And so we certainly work with a lot of brands that are otherwise not in physical retail or have scarce physical retail, like, you know, the Buck Masons of the world. 
Um, we like to work with others that aren't overly reliant on wholesale, um, where they're sort of prolifically available. Um, but it's really sort of open to all. And what we found in, interestingly uh, recently is that a lot of brands have been really disillusioned by those sort of traditional relationships with department stores. So the brands we're really hearing from right now, in addition to this sort of crowd where on this slide, it's predominantly, uh, you know, direct consumer brands, but we've started to really hear from, um, you know, major international names that have been really sort of disenfranchised and sort of, uh, hurt by various sort of bankruptcies and issues for larger department stores that operate on a very traditional wholesale basis. For us, it's much more nimble. It's a, a much broader array of metrics we can measure and provide and really look at sort of accomplishing a lot of different goals. And so it's, it's there and relevant to tiny sort of independent local brands, uh, certainly the major sort of growth uh, sort of brands that are predominantly online. And then obviously as well, major names as well. So um, we really run the gamut. And for us, it, it's really f sort of a focus on um, whether or not they are willing to do something interesting and compelling inside the space. Right. Awesome. Great. So any other questions you can see Matt over in the breakout session that's in the sessions to the left. And now I'm going to introduce uh, Brian Sugar of Group 9. Uh, Matt, thank you very much and have a great day.